welcome everybody to the Real Crusades History podcast. I'm here with one of my good friends, Dr. Helena Schroeder. Helena, how are you doing today? Fantastic. I'm in Kithra, Greece, my favorite place. Yeah, that's got to be outstanding. So, so kudos to you on that. So, okay. So Helen and I had kind of an interesting thing we wanted to do here. There is a video on YouTube about the Third Crusade by a guy named Thersides the Historian. That's his YouTube name. And um, I thought it would be interesting to look at this video and talk about, you know, what's, what's correct in it, what's incorrect in it. Just give kind of a little breakdown. Uh, nothing you know, nothing against Thersides or, or what he's doing, uh, just kind of a, a little friendly uh, evaluation. Uh, I think, you know, that's kind of an important part about uh, presenting history is we want to get things historically accurate. And uh, that's, that's when we're doing our job as uh, presenters of history is if we, uh, is if we get our facts right. And um, it's, it's our duty to evaluate each other and, uh, you know, let one another know when we're getting something wrong. Dr. Schroeder and I are going to go ahead and start taking a listen to this video, and we're going to give uh, our comments. So here we go. This is a Thersides video. Last video on the Second Crusade, I pointed out that the greatest long-term danger to the survival of the Crusader states was the rising power of their Muslim neighbors who were becoming more organized and more able to counter them militarily. Well, um, what we see is that this was a process which seemed like it would inevitably end in the triumph of the Muslim powers over the Crusader states. And after the Second Crusade, just to recap a bit, the out states of Outrimmer were enraged at one another. They all blamed each other for the failure of the Second Crusade. So they really ceased cooperating, and it looked like they were on the verge of being picked off one by one. However, so I thought I might stop there for a minute. Uh, I think that's kind of a common misconception about the Second Crusade, that it resulted in a situation where the Crusader states were just doomed, right? And I think this Absolutely. is more, yeah, this is more just hindsight. Um, mm -hmm. And especially this idea that, like he says, after the Second Crusade, the, the Crusader states were just all bickering with each other. They just kind of collapsed into chaos. I mean, that is just not true at all. In fact, what we really see happen after the Second Crusade, is that the Crusader states go through a pretty pronounced recovery, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem becomes quite powerful, in fact, under kings like Baldwin III and Amalric. Wouldn't you say so, Helena? Absolutely. That was a period of expansion. 1153, of course, saw the capture of Ascalon at the end, and of course, throughout the 60s, there are four different uh, um, episodes where the Crusader Kingdom is on the offensive in Egypt, uh, you know, taking sides, supporting the Fatimids against the Abbasid, uh, the Abbasidian Caliphate. Abba but the Zengids, yeah. Yeah, right. And um, so this, no, this was not a period in which they, and it was also a period in which they were at closely allied with the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, they were marrying into the Byzantine royal family and they had strong support from the Byzantines and, and strong fleet as a result. Yeah, absolutely. So let's jump back to our video, see what else we got here. Now, what happens, though, is that there's a new ruler who emerges in Egypt, overthrowing the Fatimid Caliphate, and then he manages to invade his old homeland of Syria and conquer that as well. And then he will create a united Muslim power, which will represent an existential threat to Outrimmer. So who is this guy and what did he do? We'll find out in just a minute. I want to build some suspense. And he really stunned the world, however, when in 1187, he managed to capture the city of Jerusalem, the capital of the kingdom of Jerusalem. And that is the event that really stunned Europe and made this guy a household name. And his name, of course, was Saladin was the name of this new ruler who founded the state which unified Syria and Egypt. But he eventually intervened in Syria when he finally got the invitation he was looking for, and he captured the city of Damascus in 1174. And he was then delayed because there were periodic revolts in favor of both of these old regimes in both Egypt and Syria that he had to deal with. And some of these will also crop up, um, you know, even sort of during the period of the crusade itself. So he was a guy who had multiple fires to contend with. And we shouldn't oversimplify history and assume that he had this neat series of triumphs, which were, um, you know, completely accepted by everyone under his rule. So actually, that makes him a lot more impressive because he has to deal with internal opposition while he is dealing with this huge crusade coming from the West. Uh, what about that crusade? What's going on in the West now that the news that Jerusalem has fallen has reached? 
the Pope and the various kings of Europe. Keep in mind that... So I think that is pretty fair in terms of the fact that he points out that there's there's some nuance about mm -hmm. Saladin's rise. Uh, you know, that is one thing I think that people get wrong sometimes is they'll think, oh, well, Saladin, you know, he comes to power and he unites the Muslim world, which really mm -hmm. is, is not true. He does manage to... Uh, through both conquests and political political maneuvering, he manages to stitch together a pretty uh, substantial coalition, which does include significant parts of of uh, you know Sunni Syria, and then of course he you know hit the base of his power, which was Fatima in Egypt, which he uh, you know converts into his power base. So yeah, let's let's keep going with our video here. Normal expectation of life for everyone who was alive and in power that they could expect Jerusalem to be in the hands of their co-religionists. So that is why the fall of Jerusalem was so shocking for the various monarchs of Europe. So once the call for a crusade went out, Henry II of England and Philip II Augustus of France actually ended a war that they were fighting against each other and decided to go on crusade together to retake Jerusalem. And both of them would appear in person, according to this agreement. And also Frederick Barbarossa, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was now an old man, decided he also would join in on crusade. So the three most powerful monarchs of Western Europe were all getting in on the action. Now, Henry II, who I pictured here, didn't quite make it to the Middle East because there was a succession dispute as he was about to leave. And his eldest son, Richard, was determined that he should be named as the heir to the But when he asked his father, Henry, about it, Henry kind of demurred and, you know, really didn't make it clear which of his three sons would become king. So Richard pledged his allegiance to Philip and the two of them worked together to kill Henry, which put Richard on the throne. And we know him, of course, as Richard I the Lionheart, but I will make an argument in this video that we should really call him Richard the Dick, because this is a guy who proved himself to be insufferable time after time after time. And we'll see that his career of alienating everyone around him and being a complete prick continues throughout his lifetime and is the biggest factor in his long-term failure. So <laughs> after Richard kills his dad, he takes over as king and as the leader of the English contingent in the crusade. So now we have Richard the Lionheart. That's how he got on this crusade. He's probably the most famous figure, unless you, you can make an argument for Saladin, one of the two most famous figures of the crusade. Okay. Let's go okay, on. so, yeah, we need to stop here. Oh, my gosh. So this is, yeah, Helena, do you want to start? Well, I mean, this is the polemic, which is where, which where he really goes off base, because he seems to spend the most of the rest of the video basically trying to support this thesis that Richard was was some sort of perverse, um, you know, person who wasn't incapable of getting along with anybody, ignoring the fact that he was extremely popular in his own time. Um, and it starts with, as you say, this allegation that he killed his father, which he did not. Um, and it- That's just really getting your facts wrong. I mean- Is contrary because most people say that it was the knowledge that John Blackland had joined Richard's rebellion was what broke Henry's heart at the end, but he certainly died in bed and he certainly was not a victim of Richard. Um, the other thing I think what's important to note is he, this is that he says, because he comes, became King of England, that's how he got onto the crusade. No, Richard was the first one to take the cross before Philip and his father. And when he was still Count of Poitou and Richard was very, very dedicated to the crusade. This idea that the conflict between uh, Richard and Henry is all Richard's fault. It's just ridiculous. I mean, I think that, you know, Henry had issues with all of his children or all of his yeah. sons, basically. I mean, first of all, there's a tradition of Plantagenet princes fighting their father. Edward the first does it, uh, challenges his father. Edward the third brings down his father and lets him be murdered, possibly viciously. Um, Edward the black prince had problems with his father. Plantagenet princes were pretty powerful and feisty and arrogant and powerful and good fighting men as a whole, with some ex rare exceptions. And they often challenge their fathers, one. Two, the, I, and this is where I would have to write a dissertation on, but if you go back and look at Richard's re, um, relationship with his father, there are a number of times when Richard and Henry fight together against Geoffrey and Henry, the young king. They fight together against the rebellion barons um, in Aquitaine. 
Henry and Richard had a very good relationship and they're arguably the two that were closest. And I would say if I had time, if I was young enough to do a new dissertation, I would say that the reason Richard's final rebellion was so bitter was because he'd been so close to his father. It was a function of a love-hate, that he actually loved his father so much and they'd been cooperating so well that he could not understand why his father would not name him heir. And that it was that, you know how, how if you've loved somebody very deep, deeply, a sense of betrayal is what turns you most viciously against them. So I think there's a lot more psycho psychology at play here in the relationship between Richard and Henry that hasn't been adequately explored in most histories. There, there's a part. There's also a part in Gillingham's book where he talks about Henry had this policy of always making promises but never delivering mm -hmm. on them as a way to keep people constantly um, eager and constantly kind of under his thumb. And so it's like he almost kind of treated his sons that way. Like he never really was clear with them. Or you don't make enemies of all four of your sons without being a little bit to blame. All right. So I guess we'll go ahead and keep going here. So the three crusading powers had two different paths to get to the Middle East. Frederick Barbarossa and his Holy Roman Imperial force decided to march overland through the Balkans and Byzantium. That's how he came into contact with Isaac II and how they had their interesting little um, Cold War. And uh, he <laughs> decides to basically follow the route that the First Crusade had taken and that he himself had taken as a subordinate of his uncle Conrad back during the Second Crusade. As for Richard and Philip, by this, at this point, they're still getting along really well. And they are moving their armies together by sea, which is faster and would avoid all of the potential pitfalls that the Germans had encountered during the 1140s. So they are planning to arrive by sea. Let's see how that goes. So as we discussed earlier, after some initial tension, Frederick Barbarossa was able to pass through Byzantium and enter into Asia Minor, where he intended to march across. And then... Okay. I think that what happened between... Um, the army of Frederick Barbarossa and the Byzantines was a little more than some initial tensions. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also he, he said that there was a cold war between, between Frederick and the Byzantine emperor. Uh, no, it was a hot war. Um, <laughs> I guess we're ready to keep going. Philip and Richard are in a bit of a honeymoon phase in their friendship. Oh, so no. They just put Stop. <laughs> They were never in a honeymoon phase. The minute Richard became king of England, he took his father's perspective, and that was defend the badge of an empire, and that was meaning stop Philip from trying to kill it. So at this point, Philip and Richard are in a bit of a honeymoon phase in their friendship. So obviously Philip had just put Richard on the throne of England, and Richard was pretty grateful. So Okay. <laughs> That is just crazy. I'm sorry. Like, like Philip II put Richard on the throne of England? As if he wasn't the heir, and if he wasn't the king. <laughs> I just, I don't yeah. know. That, that's one of the really, really, really rough ones. But anyway, we'll keep going. Yeah. Of them are marching together through France with their armies. Everything is good. And then the two of them are set to go to a different port. And each one of them will get ships and ship out to Sicily. And then from Sicily to um, Outrimmer. And then they're going to march on Jerusalem. Everything is set. Everything is fine. But then things slowly start to fall apart. Now, Philip is a famous state organizer, Philip II Augustus, arguably the greatest uh, French medieval king and definitely the greatest state builder of that era for France. Um, so he's an organized guy. He manages to get to Genoa, hire ships. Which Genoa was actually in Italy. I think I said South France earlier. Obviously, Genoa is Italy. So basically Richard was a better um, orga organizer than Philip. I mean, he, this is true that Philip was a great statesman, but Richard's preparations and execution of his crusade far outstrip what Philip was able yeah. to do. So, and that's that's what's it's bizarre about this commentary because it's like so Richard, you know, create builds an entire fleet to take his crusaders to the Holy Land. Right, and this is this is one of the glaring things from the Muslim chronicles is the Muslims are infinitely more impressed by Richard's. The, by what Richard's able to achieve and the, the organizational abilities of Richard yeah. than they are with Philip. They think Philip pales in comparison. And this is yeah. from the enemies. And yeah, it's just, it's just correct. So it's just, it, this guy almost makes it sound like Philip was the one who really, you know, did the great organizing for the third crusade and Richard was just kind of tagging along or something. I mean, that's crazy. In yeah. fact, in fact, when, when Philip went home, he had to borrow ships from Richard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep going. 
he was Richard was also an amazing financier. But go ahead. Yes. That's yeah, that's one thing that is is often neglected about Richard is his his, uh, his brilliance with uh, financial matters. Yeah. He was incredibly shrewd financially, and that's one of the the terms that the, that uh, Ibn Al Athir uses to describe Richard is shrewd. Yeah. yeah. So this guy wasn't just like some hothead who rushed no. into battle. He was quite clever. So, okay. Our ships, and they set out for Sicily. No problems. Well, Richard gets to Marseille, which is one of the cities in Philip's realm, and uh, his fleet isn't there because once again, as in the Second Crusade, some of the English decided to stop off in Portugal and help out the Portuguese. So Richard gets impatient, and he's a little bit angry, and he decides to leave his men and race off to Sicily in person because he has some personal business to attend to. So when Richard's army rejoins him, he decides that he needs to intervene in Norman affairs. His father had arranged for the marriage of Richard's sister to um, King William II of Sicily, who was one of the greatest of the Norman leaders. But when William II died, uh, William's heir decided to imprison Richard's sister, and uh, Richard wasn't having any of that. So this is a bit of a detour and a bit of a diversion, but it's pretty understandable. I mean, obviously, if your sister's in prison and you happen to be in this distant land at the time, you got an army, it makes sense you'd do something. So, you know, I get it. But then Richard decides to uh, do other stuff as well. He decides to break off his engagement to Philip's half-sister. That was part of their deal early on and one of the bases of their friendship. And then he randomly marries a princess from Navarre, which is at this time one of the Spanish kingdoms. It's a <laughs> kingdom of the Basque, basically. So that is a major um, thing that he does, which starts to break up his friendship with Philip. Um, now Philip can't really trust Richard's word because not only did he go on a little bit of a detour, which would otherwise be understandable, but then he decided to randomly change his marriage arrangements. So okay. this Richard look a little on. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, there's not a detour involved here. They were planning to meet in Sicily, right? I also rate, like to point out that that um, he keeps talking about the English. He's forgetting that most of Richard's troops are from Normandy, uh, Anjou, Poitiers, Maine, Gascony, and Aquitaine. The issue with Alice is that the um, arrangements had been made between their fathers, between Henry II and Louis the Seventh. Right. This is not this is Philip's dear sister that he's made this deal with Richard because this is part of their friendship that he's going to marry the sister. No, this was a betrothal when Alice was the age of seven. And so this is not a personal relationship. And this is not about Philip's deal with Richard. And they've made this promise. And this is how they're going to seal their friendship. This was a betrothal made by their respective fathers when both of them, when Richard and Alice were small children. But she's her, she's Philip's half sister. She's born by, by, by Louis the Seventh's second wife. Say the, the fascinating thing is so when Philip's trying to, to, to pull Richard away from his father and he's trying to put a wedge between the Plantagenets so that he can take down the empire, he tells Richard that Alice has been sleeping with his father or rather that his father has been sleeping with Alice. So that it's like your father is sleeping with your betrothed. It was a Philip's way of trying to make Richard angry with his father. It was part of Philip's manipulation of Richard to make him revolt against his father. Right, and that's one of the things I think is so interesting. You, you so often hear this idea that, uh, that, that Richard claimed that. No, no, this comes from Philip originally, doesn't it? Like yes, Philip's, it the, Philip's the one who started spreading this idea that, that yes. Henry, Henry the old king had slept with Richard's betrothed. Yes, to try to get Richard to break with his father, because as I say, Richard and, and his father had actually been quite close and had been working together and cooperatively so for much of their lives. So yes, this is not a fantasy of Richard's. That's maybe a fantasy of Philip's and there's good reason to doubt whether it was true. But the point is what, because Philip was the one who raised it, he handed Richard the, the grounds for saying, I can't possibly marry, you know, a woman who's who's been, you know, debauched by my own father. Right. And I think, too, our our buddy Thersides here says that uh, Richard randomly decides to marry uh, Baron Gala yes. of Navarre. I mean, that is crazy because his marriage to Baron Gala made good political sense because Navarre was located close to his southern, what is now his, his southern French uh, holdings. Aquitaine. Yeah. Aquitaine, yeah. So Navarre is, is close to this territory, and um, 
so the king of Navarre is a natural and very beneficial ally to Richards. Yeah. And in fact, later on, this alliance with Navarre would prove quite helpful to Richard. Are we ready to keep going? Yep. <laughs> okay. ...in the eyes of his key ally. Because remember, not only will they crusade together, but they're planning to then go home and rule neighboring countries together. So this is not a very smart... They're planning to go home and kill each other and fight each other. Right, that's crazy. For the last 20 years. Yeah, the way this guy presents it, he's like, he, he, he acts like, you know, Philip is just like planning to just have a nice, cozy relationship with his buddy Richard. Philip is thinking, I am going to conquer all of his territory. I'm going to, you know, stick it to that son of a bitch. You know? Yeah. And, and again... Humiliated my father... Right, yeah, Th these these uh, darn Angevins, you know, I mean, like, that's what he's thinking. And this is a conflict that predates Richard and Philip. I mean, this is, this conflict between the Angevins and the Capuchins is a, it looms large in this period of time. So this mm -hmm. idea that, like, somehow this, that Richard started this or something, and and the idea of Philip's innocence in all this is crazy, too. I mean, so, anyway. Yep. Here we go. Um, and then Philip will be further annoyed when he reaches out Rimmer by mid-May, but Richard keeps getting into detours. So um, Philip is safely in the Middle East, and then at about the same time, Richard is sailing to the Middle East as well, now that he's dealt with his problems in Sicily, um, and he's taken his sister with him. And uh, one of his ships happened to get grounded during a storm, and it happened to be his treasure ship. Well, this was seized by the ruler of Cyprus, who was Isaac Comnenus, one of the cousins of Manuel. And the two initially reached an agreement uh, for that ship to be returned, but then Isaac decided to renege because he assumed... Uh, stop, 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 yeah. stop, stop. Okay, <laughs> crazy. First of all, there's massive storms that just totally dispose Richard's fleet. He has spent time on roads collecting his, recollecting his fleet, and it's actually dozens of fleet ships are still missing, and among them are the ship with his wife, with his bride, not yet married, but his bride, and his sister, and he hopes to find them in Cyprus because the plan had been in advance that they would, you know, if they got dispersed, they would, re they would reassemble on Cyprus. He gets there and finds that his sister and his fiance are aboard one vessel, disabled vessel in the harbor of Limassol, and they... Uh, one of the ships that, that uh, moored on Cyprus contained Berengela and Joan, the two most important oh women in Richard's life. That's right. But the, the point was that three other ships had actually wrecked on the island and their crews and pe the passengers were enslaved by Isaac Comenos. So did we have that? Did you get that? And uh, yeah. So, so that there was every reason to think that there were not very honorable intentions towards the two women because they would probably be held at least as hostages, if not worse. So, and Richard, when he arrived, requested the ability of his fleet to take on water and ask for reparations for the ships that were captured, of course, the return of his men. And it's when Isaac allegedly sent him a very rude answer, so rude that the Chronicles don't ever say the word, but they all agree that it was scandalous language. Right. Right. So we'll continue on here. Yep. Yeah. He, okay. Uh, Richard did not. And then he, to his credit, managed to somehow conquer Cyprus in only five days. <laughs> um, so that was pretty impressive. His his conquest of Cyprus is is one of the most remarkable um, uh, achievements. achievements. I mean, military yeah. achievements of probably the medieval era, and it's 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 a testament to just incredible competence. Again, it's not just one some random thing he happened to be able to do, and it was not five five a mere five days that this happened. So, and as you say, it would include amphibious operations, which were outstanding, landing against um, an enemy held shore. It, it required a tremendous amount of strategy because he divided his forces into three ways. He rolled up the coast and then struck inland. Um, the fortresses of, of Cyprus have never been taken by storm. Um, Isaac Menes was in a very, very strong position. So it is. it was a remarkable achievement and it was not random. The decision to do it, and this is the most important thing, was based on the very, very rational understanding of the importance Cyprus could have for supporting the Holy Land because it provided a safe base and it could, meant that you could control the, the, sh the, the sea lanes to the Holy Land and you would also have a breadbasket for feeding the, the Holy Land. 
Right. I mean, Richard's conquest of Cyprus is one of the most brilliant moves in the history of the Crusades. It had an impact. It had a positive impact on the entire rest of the history of Crusader Outremer. I mean, up until you know the fall of of Acre, and then it continued to be a bastion of Latin Christendom for centuries after that. So. Yes. This is an incredible thing he achieves here, but. Yep, okay. and it certainly All wasn't right. landing. Right, yeah. Okay, we'll keep going. Not part of what he was there to do. And while he yes, was there, he the um, former king of Jerusalem. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. Lusignan, and together they celebrated Richard's marriage to Berengaria, the Navarrese princess. So if you're Philip, you have to be fuming when you hear about this. Richard decided to, to fight a side war and then he followed through with the marriage to this princess that you disapproved of. Philip, at this point, may have still thought that um, he had a chance of getting Richard to see logic and marry his own half-sister, but uh, then it happened. Right. So, oh just a second. I really wonder where he's getting this. That's exactly I just, what I thought when I heard this. I have no idea where he, he this, this is craziness. And I've never read any source that, that thinks that Philip was still imagining that Richard was going to come back and marry his sister. I mean, this was, which, this, Philip and Richard had a, had a dynastic conflict that no, no marriage was ever going to fix anyways. And, you know, there was this bit about Philip may have actually been interested in Johanna for a short time or whatever, but this is, I, I've never read a source that, that speculates the way he does about this innocent Philip still in love with Richard and hoping that he's going to marry his sister. I just don't know where it's coming from. Yeah, th that's what I keep thinking. I mean, I don't know what book you would read where you would get this kind of information. And the idea that Philip is over there going, oh, my gosh, could we just get on with the, the work of the crusade? He's off there fighting this crazy side war. Nobody thought that. Everybody thought Oh man, he just conquered Cyprus. God, that's going to help us out. And what Philip was thinking was, oh, here once again, Richard has has shown himself that he's more competent than me, and that really annoys me. You know, it, like Philip Philip couldn't could never appreciate Richard's capabilities and the fact that he he made the right strategic decisions so often because it just irritated him so much that Richard was always outdoing him. I mean, yeah. that's that's what Philip thought. Philip wasn't. Uh, trying to get Richard back on track or something. Philip was annoyed at how on track Richard was, and <laughs> and nobody at the siege, yeah. nobody at the siege of Acre thought that Richard was wasting time by conquering Cyprus. He basically saved the Crusader states. I mean, he he delivered a bunch of uh, safe estates to a lot of the dispossessed nobility of Outremer. So In yeah. To be fair, at the time they were struggling in Accra, and they were waiting for the, that 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 lot for Richard's tr troops, uh, because they had failed to take it after sure. how many years? Here. So I think that in retrospect and in long term, yes, Cyprus was brilliant, and that shows how intelligent and strategic Richard was thinking. At the time, I think there were a lot of people in Accra who just wanted him to get over there. Yeah, because I think they want Richard's strategic vision. So they were looking at their little fight here in Accra, and they were annoyed that he wasn't there. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think, you know, once the, once the news actually broke that Richard had taken Cyprus, it was kind of like, well, wow. well, awesome, great. You know, I mean, nobody was like, oh, good Lord, what a waste of time. I mean, but yeah, you're no. absolutely right that people were very anxious for him to get there. So, yeah. Okay. So I guess we're ready to keep going. Here we go. Oh, you're already pretty peeved, and Richard at this point has committed to doing what he wants. And uh, you know, if you're someone with an ego as big as his, it's hard to go back to reality from that point. <laughs> I'm just gonna say right now, oh, let's let's be honest. I mean, I, I guess I guess one thing you could accuse medieval rulers of being was egotistical, but it's it's like. I don't know. Just Philip had a big ego too. I mean, look, pretty much everybody we're talking about in this had had an, had an ego. So, but anyway, yeah. we'll keep going. Yeah, arrived a bit late for the siege of Acre, but he still participated, and his contributions to the battle were decisive. He was by far the best general of this group of kings, and militarily, at least, he was their superior in every conceivable way. So he brings this siege to a successful end, and now there is a conflict. 
between the various leaders of this crusade over leadership in the Near East. So King Guy wants to be restored to power in Jerusalem. After all, he had been the king. But he has a subordinate named Conrad, I think of Montferrat or something like that, who decided that um, Guy's time had come and gone and that it was time for a change in leadership. Now let's stop. <laughs> One of, of Guy's subordinates, Conrad of Montferrat. Right. And it's just that they, he's just decided to become king. There's not a mention, there's, they do not mention that there are heirs to the throne and that there's a high court which decides between heirs. Right. Guy king, not because he was the son of the previous king. He married the heir, Sibylla, who dies in 1190. And she, he loses with that if he had not already lost it at Hattin, as many barons thought he had his right to be king. And there's a, the new heir is Isabella. I, he writes this whole entire video. He never once mentions the legitimate queens of Jerusalem. Right. About these people as if there was, they were in a vacuum. It has nothing to do with the legitimate rulers. It has nothing to do with the constitution of Jerusalem. He never once mentions the high court, which elects the kings of Jerusalem. And this is a common, common error. When you said we want to talk about this part to just talk about common misconceptions, there is far too little understanding that medieval states were constitutional states and it was not all about absolutism and just kings doing what they wanted and you could decide to challenge them or not. Or however, you know, here it was, it was Richard just makes Guy or he makes Conrad King. There's, there's a constitutional basis for that and there are legal procedures that have to be followed. To right. Rant, you can. <laughs> no, ab absolutely, and um, this is this is one of the biggest, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to address this video because I feel like somebody watching it could be really misled about this history. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just again the, the issue here is the the legitimate uh, heiresses of the kingdom and uh, what the high court's going to decide, and on on top of that, just to to make the mistake of saying that. Conrad of Montfort was some subordinate of Guy of Lusignan. I mean, that's just, that's just he decides to revolt because he thinks it's time for a change. Right. I mean, that is just that is just dramatically poor history. I mean, it's it's pure historical error. And yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna make a a historical presentation, you have a responsibility to get basic facts like that right. I mean, Con, Con Conrad of Montfort, you know, came out of a totally different situation and. You know, uh, it inserted himself into uh, the dynastic dispute uh, mainly through his his heroism at at Tyre, and you know, he was he was a guy who, who who seized the initiative, and and you know there was a certain faction that wanted that got him to marry uh, Isabella. You know, so I think it goes on. If you go back to the tape, he's going to say something like, "Guy had never done anything wrong." So of course, Philip. So, so Richard decides to support him. It's like, no, he just lost the entire kingdom. He just used. <laughs> Throne, you slipped the throne and then lost the entire kingdom. The only thing that was saved was Tyre because of Montferrat. You know, and it's I mean, really this is really bad. It's it's really bad. Yeah, and that's why we have to address it. But anyway, we'll keep going and see where it goes. Positions. Um, so what ends up happening is Richard uses his newfound prestige from the Siege of Acre to back up Guy. I mean, Guy was at his wedding, he must be a pretty good guy. Um, and he must not have messed up his king. So Richard he must not have messed up his king. Um, Conrad, the entire kingdom was not messing up his king, and he was even perfect. Well, also, did you catch that? Like he says, uh, Richard used his newfound prestige after the siege yes. of Acre to basically make Guy king. That's not what happened. I mean, that's no. just simply not what happened. In fact, what happened was Richard ended up acknowledging Conrad. Richard did initially back Guy, right? But once the decision was made by the high court that they wanted Conrad, Richard was willing to go with that. By marriage or by blood to both Conrad and Philip II. So they obviously side with Conrad. Um, and this is a real um, butting of heads. Leopold, of course, the thing as I explained earlier, was the guy leading the remaining Holy Roman Imperial troops who were part of this. So there was a deal struck between these leaders after you know some very tense and nasty negotiations that Guy would remain as king and he would be restored but that he would have to adopt Conrad as his heir. So as, as a compromise, but ultimately Richard won out. And uh, Philip and Leopold were both absolutely disgusted by the way things had gone and the way that Richard had you know, strong-armed this process. 
that both of them decided to leave. Leopold, because, you know, he didn't really have that big of a stake in this anyway. Um, his contingent wasn't big enough for him to compete with uh, Richard. And Philip, both because he was tired of dealing with Richard and because he was suffering from some, some ill health. And that way, oh. it's kind of fitting. Yes. No, that is not why Philip decided to leave. We all know why <laughs> Philip decided to leave. It had nothing to do with the, the uh, situation with the kings of Jerusalem. Philip wanted to go back so he could, because he thought that the crusade was the perfect opportunity with Richard far away, because Philip knew very well he couldn't outdo Richard as, as, a, as a military commander. He thought this would be his chance to retake some of, uh, or not retake, but actually conquer. Yeah, yeah, some of, yeah. this, this, was, this was ancient territory that belonged to Richard's uh, ancestors. You know, Richard was descended from the Counts of Anjou and, uh, you know, the, oh, the, the Dukes of Aquitaine. So, yeah, uh, F Philip wanted to take control of parts of Normandy, and that's why he left. So, yeah. And there's most of the crusading uh, chronicles, of course, emphasize that he wasn't really sick either. Right. Yeah. And and on top of that, I mean, this was a huge scandal. I mean, yeah. Philip shamed himself by doing this to the point where even, uh, um, you know, as you know, Jean of Joinville, who was yeah. a, a, a chronicler of from the French perspective, you know, writing about one of uh, he was writing about uh, uh, Philip's grandson, uh, Louis the Ninth. He uh, he says that it was shameful that Philip left, and that Richard, in fact, w was the one who did the right thing. So yeah. that's pretty incredible. And and the fact the fact that the Duke of Burgundy and the French Crusaders remained because they were scandalized that that their own king would abandon the Crusade, and they remained true to their Crusader vows. Yeah, absolutely. The the bulk of the French army stayed because this was so scandalous. And and you know, I think everybody knew well that Philip was going back because he wanted to to try to take control of, of uh, Richard's territory. And incidentally, he, he promised he would not do that before he exactly. left. Exactly, he swore on, on holy relics that he would not. Right, so he, he breaks this oath, you know. Yep. Okay, we'll keep going here. Yep. And Augustus, because uh, Augustus also was a great state builder who had bad health. Anyway, so <laughs> both of them leave the Middle East. And Philip, though, does leave behind 10,000 men and a lot of money to help pay them. So Richard, who is the best general, is now fully in control, or almost fully in control, um, of this crusade. And it is rolling forward from Acre, presumably, to Jerusalem. So what happens from there? <clears throat> so with Richard firmly established as the key personality in the Third Crusade, and Saladin being the sultan of the regime that had captured Jerusalem, the most famous rivalry in the crusade and possibly the most famous rivalry of the entire middle ages was set up. Now, um, Richard wanted to meet Saladin and negotiate for the return of Jerusalem, but Saladin said that Kings could only meet after an agreement had been reached. And because of this difference in ideas about how negotiations should go down, the two of them never actually met face to face. Richard did however, meet quite a bit with Saladin's brother as they tried to work this out. Now, there had been previous engagements, both by the locals and by um, the crusading force itself, which had resulted in the taking of prisoners by each side. So Richard, being Richard, um, as this negotiation dragged out, decided to send a message to Saladin by taking the 2,700 prisoners he had and having them beheaded in front of Saladin's army. And Saladin had no choice but to retaliate in kind. So if Richard had been hoping for a diplomatic solution, he basically flushed that opportunity straight down the toilet by doing that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. So I think this is kind of, this is one of the worst parts of the uh, video where he says that, so over the course of the war, they just happened to get some prisoners. They've each got some prisoners and Richard just decides to execute a bunch of prisoners. Just Richard right. being Richard. I mean, yeah. wrong. <laughs> do you know, did you look at all into this? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, do, do you want to go or should I go? Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm all right. I might so go ahead, keep talking. Yeah. Okay. So of course, what actually happened is that Richard made an agreement with Saladin on the surrender of Acre, that the garrison who were captured when Acre surrendered would be ransomed by Saladin, and Saladin agreed to ransom them. And then they set deadlines for that, and Saladin kept breaking his word continuously. You know, he kept breaking the deadlines, breaking the deadlines. Okay. And there's a very, very important part of this negotiation because it also included the return of the True Cross, which had been lost at the Battle of Hattin. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want, I want to raise this because when it came to when Saladin for the third time does not deliver either, first of all, he was supposed to release president, pres, prisoners, the same number that Richard held, whether it was 2,700 or more or less, we don't really know. But the same number of prisoners were supposed to be exchanged. There's supposed to be a prisoner exchange and the hostage and there was supposed to be payment in gold and there was supposed to be the return of the true cross. Those were the main conditions of the surrender of Accra. And when Saladin fails the, for the third time to live up to the terms, never delivers neither the gold nor the Christian hostages, nor the two cross, Richard had a severe morale problem in his army. Yeah, so basically Saladin put Richard in a situation where he had to do something. He, he, had, he had this morale problem with his army. Saladin kept breaking this agreement, kept basically screwing Richard around. And Saladin was doing this on purpose. I mean, Saladin, uh, there's a historian named John Hosler who recently wrote a really good book on the Siege of Accra. And one of the things he points out in this very exhaustive study of the Siege of Accra is that Saladin basically decided to write off the, the garrison of Accra. He was willing to use their lives as a delaying tactic to keep Richard uh, pinned up in Accra to prevent him from progressing down the coast. This is what Saladin wanted to do. He was willing to gamble with the lives of all these soldiers who had fought so valiantly for him in Accra. This was a decision Saladin made. He decided these guys were expendable, okay? And that's, that's on Saladin. I mean, and Richard basically was put in a position of having to do something. And what he chose to do was execute these guys to, to basically say to Saladin, look, you can't toy with me. If we make an agreement, you have to respect it. Mm -hmm. Saladin basically wrote off the garrison of Accra. He basically said, look, it's more important to me to delay Richard and screw with him and keep him penned up in, in, uh, in Accra. And on top of that, um, Destroy, you know, disturbing morale in the Crusader army, which Saladin understood exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was he was trying to grind the army down, right? Yeah. And, and and Richard called his bluff. And the interesting thing about this is, um, some of the the Muslim chroniclers are critical of Saladin for basically, you know, not honoring the these these were the most valiant of Saladin's warriors. Right. They had the the toughest job defending Accra, starving to death, trying to hold on to the city. And Saladin basically says, uh, whatever, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to write you guys off and, you know, uh, not help you. Richard gave them, Saladin, every opportunity to, to ransom these guys. And Saladin most certainly had the means to do it, you know. And well, that's, that, I, I'm going to be fair, to be fair to Saladin, my thesis is that he had the money and he had the prisoners he could have probably returned, but he didn't have the true cross. Okay, he, okay. That's fair. The true cross he meant nothing to them. It had been dragged to the streets. They pissed on it all the things that they wanted to prove that it, how worth this piece of what it was. And then they didn't, then they mislaid it. So, but you're right. You know, he could have said that. He could have come back to Richard and say, look, here are the prisoners and here's the money. Sorry about the two cross or whatever. But no, he did. He basically just stonewalls. Right. And, and the thing is, you know, he, he could have just found a random piece of wood to give them to maybe. I don't know. But, <laughs> but it, you know, well, it's something, you know. Right. But the, the relic, thing, wear, you know, something that he could have been, it put it in. The thing is, but, even Saladin's own biographer, you know, Ibn Shaddad, says that Saladin was trying to delay Richard, you yeah. know. And that is really an indictment on Saladin's treatment of his own men, because that's one place where Saladin and Richard really differed. Richard would not toy with the lives of his men. In fact, uh, uh, J.F. Verbergen, this military historian, points out that Richard is noteworthy for taking a strong interest in the welfare of yeah, his men. Absolutely. So makes him really stand. It is one of the things that makes him stand out compared to many of his contemporaries. Right. And it's just that is not that that is so often brought uh, neglected in this in this situation. And I, I'm really gl glad that uh, this new book by John Hosler um, addresses this issue because it's so. What's the title of that? I don't think I've seen it. The Siege of Accra. It's just, oh, it, just okay. it's, it's a brand, yeah. it's an exhaustive study of the Siege of Accra and it's excellent. Okay. And he goes into this and he basically touches on the issue in exactly the same way we did in our podcast, you know, back uh, a couple years ago with, with yeah. the, Dr. Donaghy, where we pointed out that look, Saladin, he, he blew these guys off. He let, he, he, 
he let their he said that they were expendable. Yeah, and at the so, and then on the other hand, Richard was facing serious problems of morale within his own troops, and he had to show that he was. People were saying about him, "Look, you're being made a fool of." You know, you his own troops, his own you know junior commanders were starting to lose faith in him because they saw, perceived him as being you know made a fool of by Saladin. Right, which Saladin was doing on purpose. He was trying to undermine Richard's yeah. authority. And the interesting thing about Richard's decision, and he knew what he was doing, this had long-term consequences for Saladin, very negative consequences for Saladin. Saladin could never again really get his men to garrison a, a fortress for him mm -hmm. because of this. And in fact, when he tried to get people to, uh, to uh, defend Ascalon, People were like, well, why don't you put your sons in there? You yeah. Know, I guess we'll keep going. So now Richard is clearly intending to fight it out and take through some Oh, support. one other thing he gets wrong. He says, so he says that basically this was the end of any possibility of negotiation. Uh, no. <laughs> Richard, Richard continued to negotiate with Saladin all through the rest of the crusade. I'm no fan of Richard the Lionheart, but I do have to cede to him that he probably was a military genius. He quickly realized that the best way to secure Jerusalem in the long run was to capture all the coastal ports and isolate this area as much as possible. So he decided to march his army to Joppa and secure the coast completely. And Saladin saw the danger as well, and he decided to intercept Richard's army at Arso. Now, the calculation by Saladin was that his harassing tactics would cause the Crusaders to divide, and if he could get some of the contingents to charge uncontrollably out of formation, he could then concentrate on beating those detachments and then wear out the army before it could reach Joppa and force it to retreat. Richard, however, managed to keep his men in formation, and eventually, once one group did break formation, the Knights Hospitallers, um, they struck out, and then Richard decided, rather than letting them go on their own, to order an all-out counterattack. And it ended in actually a great victory for Richard because he struck at just the right moment. He had that knack for timing that is something that generals really can't learn, neither have or they do have, and Richard clearly had it. So Richard wins a great That's victory. It. And yeah. did you have something to say, Helena? Yeah, I just would like to refer our viewers and listeners to um, our podcast on the Battles of Arsouf that we did with uh, Stephen Donerty because we go into this in a lot more detail and point out, of course, that the Hospitaller didn't just randomly break. It was a Hospitaller Marshal who was leading that probably had a lot to do with Richard not being there and not seeing what was happening, uh, but he reinforced it himself. But we've got a quite a good long discussion in that podcast, which I would just urge people interested in the Battle of Arsouf to listen to. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, I will put a link to our entire playlist of our podcasts on the Third Crusade in the description of this, just in case people That's want great. more info on it. So, okay, we'll keep going. Joppa, and now he's in a position to threaten Jerusalem, but he doesn't end up taking it. So what went wrong? Well, let's talk about, again, Richard's personality and, you know, the realities of war where um, a lot of opportunities are impossible to really follow up on. So the Battle of Arsuf seems to have been the first major defeat that Saladin had suffered in 20 stop, years. Stop, stop. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. Again, this is one of those things that's just a gross historical error. I mean, a casual look into the history of Saladin's career would tell you, you know, that Saladin had suffered many defeats at the hands of the Crusaders prior to the third crew. Anyway, go ahead, Helena. Yeah. No, that's, I just want to say, stop, stop, stop. Look at uh, Mont Cassard, look at Fort La Fobile. You know, they're solid and look at, at Karak twice. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just such a, a, a glaring error in facts and he's not even done yet here. Listen, he was mostly successful in every other war. I mean, I'm not sure if he had lost the battle. And so getting beaten and beaten. Okay. I mean, well, if you're not sure, you might want to look it up, my friend. I mean, you're making a historical presentation for YouTube. You know, if you're not sure about Saladin's career, let's do a little research. Because no, Saladin had lost plenty of battles in the last 20 years. He he was repeatedly defeated by King Baldwin the Fourth, the leper king. You know, that's even mentioned in Kingdom of Heaven. Come on. <laughs> Historical accuracy is just a must when you're talking about history. I understand we all have opinions and we want to give our opinions, but you've got to get the basic facts right. You just have to. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, no, I'm not sorry. It's, <laughs> it's it's the way it is, and it's the way it should be. That's that's history is all about that. Otherwise, we're we're going down a rabbit hole. You know. So yep. here, we, here we go. Severely, Arsa destroyed morale. Um, and 
because of that and because of logistical concerns, Saladin had to disband the majority of his army for the winter of 1191. And he probably knew that the citizens of Jerusalem would just simply surrender and they didn't really have any fight in them or they were still loyal to the Crusaders anyway. So How could the people in Jerusalem be loyal to the Crusaders when they were all Muslims? Right. Saladin's people. The fall of Jerusalem resulted in the complete evacuation. All of the Christian residents were expelled from Jerusalem. Jerusalem at this time was held by a Muslim garrison loyal to Saladin. Yeah, and again, just a, a huge historical error here. He says Saladin probably just sort of shrugged and decided that Jerusalem was doomed. I mean, we know that's not what happened. Saladin <laughs> went to enormous effort to garrison and fortify Jerusalem at this point. He was very worried about Richard attacking it. And he, I mean, it's like, again, Ibn Shaddad, Saladin's biographer, goes into lengthy detail about all the preparations made to defend Jerusalem. So again, we get, let's look up our facts. <laughs> okay. Solomon had already written off Jerusalem. However, Saladin uh, got lucky because Richard looked at how severe the winter was and he knew that if he laid siege to this mountain city of Jerusalem and it didn't fall immediately, that he would be exposed to counterattacks and that any relief force attacking him would catch him at a vulnerable time and state and could defeat him because he knew that although he had inflicted a defeat on Saladin, Saladin could still raise another army. Maybe Richard actually overestimated Saladin's capacity to raise troops at that given moment, however. Anyway, um, so Richard decided that the only way he could possibly make a play for Jerusalem was if he had the support of Conrad who had been established at, um, you know, in another area in power. Uh, the thing is, though, Conrad... Not true. <laughs> right, just, right. I can't, I, I can't. Just say, it's, just, it's just not true. It's, it's not true at all. It's not even... <laughs> like, like, Conrad is the, the next big power <laughs> Richard needs to draw. In fact, Conrad was negotiating separately with Saladin at this point. Right, yeah. Okay, we'll keep going. Decided that the only reason, the only way he would help is if the throne was renegotiated and given to him. And Richard, you know, he's looking out for himself, Richard being Richard. And uh, he decided that Conrad could be king. Uh, but then he gave Guy Cyprus, which. <laughs> what? Okay, okay, okay. So again, I've said it once, but I just feel compelled to say this. This is not, Richard did not control the throne of Jerusalem. He could not give it to whom he wanted. He did not give it to whom he wanted. It wasn't just to get support, first of all, who didn't need Conrad's support, would have liked Conrad to stop maybe meddling and negotiating separately, but he didn't need Conrad's support. And he certainly did not have the right to give away the throne of Jerusalem to anybody that was, well, it had to go through the legitimate heirs and it had to be agreed, agreed by the high court. Holding on to up to this point as a compensation. Um, however, uh, Richard totally ignores the fact that Cyprus had been sold to the Templars, and that the Templars had a disastrous episode there. Again, people can look into our podcast, uh, but this is just, it's not as though he's just held on to Cyprus, which was the phrase that was just used. He did not wholly sold it to the Knights Templar. Angry that someone tried to play hardball with him. That was his role. So he had Conrad assassinated before he could be crowned. You want to now, granted, there is no certain proof that Richard had um, Conrad assassinated, but it is in keeping with everything else that we know about Richard. I mean, the man murdered his own dad. He's pretty much capable of anything. And uh, he didn't like Conrad from the get-go, so he wouldn't have thought twice about paying some assassins to take out Conrad. Okay, why don't we talk about who actually killed Conrad, Thersides? Um, <laughs> is, is, is that on your agenda at all, to actually discuss what actually happened to Conrad? Um, so at least he does admit that there's not a shred of evidence that Richard did, you know, execute or yeah. have have just pay some assassins to to execute to, to to kill Conrad. What happened was Conrad was uh, on his way to dinner and he was assaulted by a couple of the assassins. You know, the the Shiite, uh, the radical Shiite group that controlled these mountain fortresses and used assassination as a political weapon. So this was something that they did routinely to. Uh, to rulers, and we don't know exactly why. In fact, we, we really don't know why they did this to, to Conrad. There, but there's there is no. There, well, I think that the issue was that there was the ship that he kept rather than paying ransom and returning the crews. He murdered a crew, one of the assassins, the crews of an, an assassin ship. 
Right. Yeah. The truth is that, that Conrad did have some personal issues with the assassins. And so it's really, you know, their behavior here is not that different from what we've seen them do in the past, you know, how they deal with, with rulers that cross them. So it's just, it's, it's a ridiculous, it's absolutely unjustifiable for, for our, our YouTube commenter here to assert that Richard, that we should just assume Richard killed Conrad. And of course he goes back to his whole thing about saying Richard murdered his own father, which is an, yeah. another blatant lie, you know, just yeah. total it lie. Makes, it, I come back to what is his source on this? Because you feel as though he's read one of Philip II's propaganda tracts. And maybe I'm not familiar with it. Because Philip, of course, II does accuse Richard of the assassination. Right. So if you pull together, if, there, if, there, if there's a chronicle out there, I don't know that I haven't read, written for Philip II as a Philip II propaganda um, document, it would cast Richard, everything that, that's being said here is fits perfectly with a Philip II propaganda film or document or chronicle where you have Rich, where he accused Richard of being, you know, the murderer of his father and you have Richard being, you know, and Philip being this innocent person and Richard just is discarding my dear sweet sister Alice that I never met. And you know, everything he says about Richard is consistent with a chronicle, including this assassination of Conrad, is consistent with Philip II's propaganda machine. All right, we'll keep going. Yep. So if you're wondering why Richard was unable to then exploit the um, weakness of Saladin now that he had Conrad on his side, well, the answer is twofold. One part is just Richard has a terrible personality and he's not really a good leader <laughs> except when he's in battle. And the other part is that the other leader... Isn't that... F how can you like only be a good leader in battle? Like the minute the battle ends, you're a bad leader. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's like some, some kind of voodoo that like you, you lose your... You lose all your abilities the minute the bat the fighting stops. But anyway, okay, here we go. We're sick of dealing with Richard, and they opposed him. So most of the leaders of the crusade, most of the other nobles there, wanted to attack Jerusalem. That was the obvious move, and it was the reason they were there. But Richard, being a dick, decides to say that, okay, if you guys vote to do that, I'll go with you, but I will not serve as your leader, even though I'm by far the best general. Because I think the appropriate course of action is to attack Egypt. Now... Later crusaders will take this bit will take this idea up of attacking Egypt. Um, there's a, a whole crusade that was launched in Egypt, um, but for the moment Jerusalem was open to the taking, and there was really no reason to not take it, except that Richard wanted to get his way. And this also points to the problem that while Richard was by far the most important and most prestigious of the leaders assembled, um, the crusading army was not the English army. Therefore, he couldn't just command it at fiat as he was accustomed to. Richard isn't the only one who thinks they shouldn't go after Jerusalem. You know, he, he's got the support of the Templars and the Hospitallers in that, the people who understand the situation most clearly. And, you know, again, we, we already addressed the fact that this, this guy is totally wrong, that Jerusalem was just open to the taking. But on top of that, um, uh, you know, this was actually the, the, probably the right thing to do. Richard understood, you know, because he, Richard famously knew how to take the right advice. You know, Richard was very open to taking advice. He, he was always seeking the best uh, counselors. And in this case, he knew that the Templars and Hospitallers who had the most experience fighting in the Holy Land knew very well that uh, it would be a bad idea to go after Jerusalem when it was so well positioned and well defended. You know, this would, again, this would put uh, Jerusalem far away from, Jerusalem was far away from the coast, which the coast was the lifeline for the crusading army. You know, that, that was where Richard's fleet was, and he could supply his army and, and protect it. Richard did not needlessly risk the lives of his men, which would have very well been the case if he'd gone after Jerusalem in this situation. So, again, just more poor commentary from Thirsty's the historian. Okay, so we'll continue on. Really have the ability to get along with other people well enough to lead by example and persuasion. Wrong. <laughs> What? As what? Jerusalem. He just said, you know, Richard didn't have the ability to get along with people. Wrong. We know that's not true. You know, Richard was 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 very good in in, in his diplomatic uh, dealings. So we'll but keep. Worse is to say he didn't lead by example. He didn't lead by example. Was there ever a king who was more in the forefront? Absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. Richard famously said he wouldn't ask his men to to take risks that that he himself wouldn't take. You know. 
So. And actually, his men were always trying to get him to step back. Right. Yeah. And he led every. I mean, the whole thing about the Battle of Jaffa again. Urge our viewers, listeners, to read our and listen to our podcast about the second half of the Battle of Jaffa, where Richard's out there challenging the entire army of Sapphira alone. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's keep going. This is when Richard throws his tantrum, and they could easily have taken the city, but they decide to retreat because they don't wrong. Yeah. Out Richard as their leader. And then they retreat back to the coast and then they don't invade Egypt. They just kind of hang out because now they're at an impasse. The leader, the other leaders are also pretty much furious with Richard. He's furious with them. Wrong. Yes. But I mean, if, if, if he's so, if, if they don't like Richard as a leader, why do they listen to him? So, right. so you know, this is, this is totally illogical. He's saying that Richard, they hate him so much. They don't respect him. So, but, but they do what he says. And then after they've done what he says, then they get mad at him. Yeah, it's it's it is, this is not this is no longer even a rational opinion. This is Alice in Wonderland at this point. So was the initiative to pass back to Saladin. So now what is Saladin going to do? At this point, Richard was on the verge of returning to England and pulling a full Cartman by saying, Screw you guys, I'm going home. But no, Richard was besieging Beirut. Yeah, one. <laughs> And he conveniently forgets the fact that John and Philip have now ganged up on him and his his entire inheritance is at risk. It's right. like he doesn't mention why Richard needs to go home. That's because he wants to go home. It's because Philip, who has promised never to, to attack his lands, is attacking his lands and has allied himself with his brother, John, and he's at risk of losing everything. Exactly. Because of the betrayal of his beautiful, wonderful Philip II, who's always portrayed heroes so nice and good. Right. Let's keep going. Saladin had other ideas. So um, as the Crusaders are still bickering and Richard is um, away from Joppa, uh, Saladin launches a surprise attack in force and takes Joppa in July. Um, the garrison of Joppa was mostly butchered. Um, some of them were saved when they took refuge in the Citadel, and Saladin was one to spare them. But his men were a lot less merciful because of previous atrocities by the Crusaders. So uh, at this point, you know, the pattern of exchanging atrocities was pretty well established and there was no fixing it. Um, anyway, so Richard decides that this will be a great opportunity for him to gain further glory, so he gathers a force of 2,000 men and launches his own surprise attack, and he managed... Uh, no, Richard was not just trying to gain glory. He was he was doing what he needed to do to secure this, the conquests he had made and to uh, to benefit the Crusader Kingdom. He knew he could, he could regain Jaffa, and so he acted. Richard... And Richard did things when they made sense and when he knew he could he could achieve them. That's why he didn't go after Jerusalem, but he did challenge Saladin's attack on Jaffa. And then the idea the idea that it was about glory when the Jaffa is the key port and the closest port to Jerusalem. It's as though you know there's there's no moderation here. There's no sense of, of there's certainly no understanding of the specific situation. No, that's that's one thing we can say for certain is that uh, this uh, Thersides, the historian uh, user on YouTube, he does not have any understanding, no grasp of the strategic issues surrounding this campaign, which you need to have some of that to make a historical presentation on a on a military conflict. Yeah. City by surprise. Saladin thought Richard was already gone and he was surprised when Richard arrived so quickly. Um, but uh, so since Saladin, though, after Richard had retaken the city, Saladin had the upper hand. He had a much bigger army. So he decides to try to take Joppa by surprise once again. But again, Richard is a very good general, and he is not taken by surprise easily. So he um, figures out this plan, and then Saladin decides, well, I still have the numbers. I'm just going to overwhelm Joppa. So he launches a big assault, and it fails. Uh, he loses a lot of men. And at this point, the two men realize that they aren't going to be able to break the impasse. Saladin has recovered sufficiently that the momentum that Richard had earlier is totally gone, and Saladin is much stronger. However, Richard is a far better general and will probably continue to humiliate Saladin. So both of these guys now are at an understanding that it is best for them to just quit while they're ahead. And that's more or less exactly what they do. So basically, both sides decided to make a compromise. Um, Richard decided to allow Saladin to continue to rule over Jerusalem so long as Jerusalem remained open to unarmed Christian pilgrims and merchants. So Christians were still free to travel to and do business in Jerusalem but they could not bring arms there, and it was a recognized part of Saladin's empire. Keep in mind that as a Muslim, Saladin and his followers also believed that Jerusalem was a holy city, 
So it contained just as much symbolic importance for them as it did to the Christians. Um, neither side was really satisfied with the results of this war and the uh, ending of it. So Saladin and his successors would look to finish off the Crusader states in due time. And the Christians would also want to reclaim Jerusalem. And they also would take up this idea of attacking Saladin's base of power in Egypt as a permanent solution for preventing the Muslims from having enough power to really threaten Jerusalem again. So both sides are looking to fight it out just at a future date. Um, there also are a lot of hurt feelings on the Crusader side against Richard. So Leopold of Austria no. is still really, really, really angry um, about Con So yeah, again, just overplaying this. Uh, yeah, yeah, certain of Richard's political enemies had a problem with him, but he was his reputation throughout Christendom was just enormous. I mean, people were... He would, this was the great crusading king who had achieved so much against Saladin. And I also think it's just ridiculous. He doesn't point out the enormous achievement Richard had, had made here. I mean, look, a couple of years ago, Saladin was on the verge of exterminating the crusader presence in Palestine. And now Richard has reconquered this long stretch of the coast, you know, these most important cities on the coast. And he's he's got Cyprus too, and he's forcing yeah. Saladin to the treaty table. Saladin, yeah. who who has a neighboring enormous you know power base, Saladin's going to have to come to the treaty table and acknowledge the existence of this entity that he shortly ago was about yeah. to destroy. So Richard has done something remarkable here. You know mm -hmm. he has re he has completely revived the Crusader Kingdom in a new car incarnation, you know, that's now based on around Accra and Cyprus instead of Accra yeah. and Jerusalem. But yeah. he has absolutely reinvigorated the Crusader states. And this is a set, it, it's a setback for Saladin. The one consolation prize for Saladin is he gets to keep Jerusalem. Yeah. But, you know. And he's also ignoring this was just a three year truce. No, I just, I just think it's very important to understand that it was a truce, not a treaty. And right. that's yeah. why everybody, both sides, were expecting to continue the conflict afterwards, including Richard, who expected to come back once he knocked heads together in France and got rid of his brother and Philip, he thought. He expected to come back. And his prestige within the Crusader states is huge. It's enormous, as you said. I think this, this focusing on, on Leopold of Austria and, of course, our friend, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Philip II, Right, yeah, these were guys who were who were rivals of Richard's and who were who were bitter because they couldn't match Richard's achievements. I mean, you know, Leopold was mad because Richard would not acknowledge that he had the right to equal plunder in Accra, which of course was what putting his flag up on the walls was all about. Murder. He was close to Conrad. So as Richard is trying to return, Conrad actually has him arrested or excuse me, Leopold has him arrested. Conrad is dead, clearly he doesn't do it. Leopold has him arrested and in prison for a couple years. Um, he hands him over to the Emperor Henry VI. And um, Henry demands a huge ransom from England to get Richard released, and he gets it. However, Philip II is still also angry at Richard, and he wants Richard to be gone as long as possible, so he actually extends Richard's prison sentence by about six months by bribing Henry. So uh, can you imagine like how unpopular you have to be to get a sovereign of a nation to pay large amounts of money that he needs to be spending on other stuff to keep you in prison. Yeah. Can, can, can you imagine how, how afraid Philip was of Richard coming and stopping him from attacking Richard's lands? Philip knew very well that Richard was vastly better than him in terms of being a, a general and, and a king, you know, ultimately. And Philip was, he, yeah, he was, he was worried about Richard showing up and, and, putting a stop to his 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 plan to how do, how do you twist the fact that somebody has broken his word that he's sworn on holy relics he's attacked a crusader which was against all of the rules of the church he's peeking a man in prison who has done nothing who has not done anything illegal not done anything wrong and that's all right. That's all okay. It's okay to keep somebody in prison. It's all right to imprison a crusade. It's okay to attack somebody else's land. It's okay to foment rebellion in somebody else's kingdom. That's all justified because Richard's some sort of a bad guy. It's like here's somebody who's patently doing everything that's un that's unethical and, and unjustified and illegal and you know, it's really disgusting, and he's a worm, you know? And, right. But it's okay, it's okay, because it, 
this this is a classic case of well, yes, she was raped, but she must have done something to provoke it. I mean, no, people just wouldn't do that if she hadn't, he hadn't provoked it, right? Yeah, yeah, this is definitely blaming the victim. And, um, you know, yeah, Leopold of Austria was excommunicated for doing this. So, okay. And died a horrible death, which people of the Middle Ages thought was because of what he'd done to Richard. Right, yeah, he had a um, a horse fall on his leg, and he it, his leg went black. He got... They had to cut it off with an axe, and he died in agony of gangrene yeah. sh shortly after all this stuff with Richard. So, yeah. Okay, we'll we'll keep we're two minutes to to the end here. The second was aggrieved at Richard. Um, as for Saladin, he actually didn't end up living much longer. He ended up dying of yellow fever in 1193, and then his heirs ended up fighting over his empire. It looks like um you know Egypt and Syria were separated and went their own ways after this. So. Uh, the state he tried to found didn't end up really taking off too well. I was just blown away by um, the the factual errors and the deliberate mis mis misrepresentations uh, in this. So, as I said, I was most distressed by the fact that it was mixed with a lot of fact, so that it's and it sounds very reasonable, and that's always when it's most dangerous. It sounds reasonable, but then it's got this amazing pro Philip bias, which really makes me go back and just wondering where what his sources are. Or why he's decided that he hates Richard so much. Yeah, I have no idea, but it's it, there's something weird going on there. But anyway, I think we've done a good job of... Uh, of course, the overall ignorance of the Crusader states is something which just bothers me generally, because most people don't understand about the constitution of the Crusader states, or the fact that they weren't just soccer balls and being hand, you know, kicked around by leaders. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, and, and the truth is, the history of the Crusades, it's it's a very complicated subject. I mean, it requires yeah. enormous study to really understand. And there's a real danger of people just turning it into a puppet show, you know, through a combination of ignorance and lack of, and, you know, refusal to study. So what can I say? I mean, you know, if, if you're going to get this stuff right, you do have to do some research and you, you've got to gain a certain understanding of it. I mean, and that's just not what, what happened here. We just got factual errors uh, compounded upon with, um, you know, just total, totally incorrect interpretations and uh, just, just blatantly wrong opinions. I mean, that, that's all. Very strong bias. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we'll probably uh, call it a day here. Uh, this, this went a little bit longer than I thought. Uh, <laughs> it was. <laughs> Like twice as long, like twice, twice as long as I thought, even at uh, one and a half uh, speed. But okay, well, Helena, um, I'm going to go ahead and stop our broadcast, and um, right. we'll be in touch. Yeah, we will be in touch, and uh, Helen and I are going to be doing some stuff about her new book, uh, Rebels Against Tyranny, in the very near future. A really cool book about the Sixth Crusade, which is another fascinating subject. So we'll be. Uh, We'll be doing some streams here, um, and Helen and I are go going to uh, organize the schedule for that, and we'll be announcing that, um, you know, probably in the next couple of days or so. So, right, great, thanks.